Hi. We are so fired up that you're here, and whether you're watching online or you're at our Kitchener campus in our West Side Auditorium or in our main auditorium, we're just thrilled that you're here to be uh, a part of our time together. So have you got your uh, mind in gear today? You got your heart pumped up? Are you ready to, to amp up the uh, level of confidence and trust and faith that you have in the Bible? Because that's where we're going today. You know what I really love? I enjoy uh, checking out whether my faith, what I believe, has some veracity has some legitimacy behind it. I love getting into debates and dialogue and discussions around what I am, what I believe with people who maybe don't believe the way that I believe. I love reading stuff that's countering what I believe. I love reading stuff that's supporting what I believe. Because if what I believe isn't legit, if what I believe can't be supported with a measure of fact and logic, then I really don't want to lean into it. If my faith isn't substantive, I don't think it's something I want to live out in my life. And so we have launched this series in particular to deal with one of the areas where I think it will amp up your faith, and that's the whole area around the Bible. And we've called this series simply, Can I Really Trust the Bible? Here's the question. Can I, can I really trust the Bible? Can I really trust, can I really trust the Bible? Can I really trust the Bible? That's really the critical question that we're asking and answering in this series, okay? Now... Um, we started this last week, uh, this series, and it's five weeks long, and so we had last Sunday and this Sunday, in which I'm trying to answer this simple question. How did we get it? How did, how did we get the Bible? And I did part one last week, and I'm going to do part uh, two this week, and then we're going to have next Sunday the most amazing event in the history of the universe, right? It's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You've got to be here. We've got Good Friday services. We've got our services on Sunday, and oh man, it's going to be just awesome as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. That's going to happen next Sunday. Then the week after, so on April the 8th, I'm going to jump back into this series, and I'm going to talk about why should we trust it. I'm going to talk about some general reasons why you can put your trust in what the Bible says. Some general reasons why, having made a claim thousands of times and thousands of times over again in the text that it's ultimately from God, why it actually supports that claim in some very, very unique and special ways. That's the third week in the series, the week after next. And then we've got two weeks when Steve Malinowski is one of the people in a part of our church that speaks here often. He's going to take the next two weeks. He's going to talk about the Bible and science, okay? Because here's our basic belief. God created the universe and God wrote the Bible. So it is an impossibility for them to conflict. Either we're not interpreting the science correctly or the Bible correctly or both of them we're not correct, correctly interpreting. But they have to fit together. We've got, to, we've got to watch that. We're going to talk about that. And he's going to talk about absolute truth and the Bible is there absolute truth out there, like a standard that you can go by. And he's going to talk about that and why the Bible is, in fact, that source of absolute truth. So it's going to be a great, great series, and I'm so glad that you guys have joined with us in that. So here's the question for the morning. I'm going to wrap this one up today. How did we get it? How did we get the Bible? Because I believe that if you understand how it is that we got this book into our hands today, it is going to help you trust it more. You good with that? Because this is where we're going this morning. So let me review what we talked about last week. And basically, you'll notice I've got these nine sort of little stands here because there are nine movements or nine um, activities that God engages in and we need to engage in as well that enable the Bible to really in, be in our hands and touch our lives. And the first thing we talked about last week was this, this particular word, and it's the word revelation. Can you say this one with me? You ready? Revelation. Yeah, revelation. Now, everything starts here, and revelation is the activity of God whereby he reveals truths about himself, life, and his will to others. God starts the Bible by starting with revelation, and he does this in a whole bunch of ways. You know, of course, that we would never be able to comprehend God if he didn't reveal himself to us. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, God is a spirit. And you and I don't know how to connect with a spirit, okay? We can't see a spirit. We can't touch a spirit. We can't hear a spirit. They don't have a body. A spirit, spirit beings don't have a body. I mean, how do you connect with that being? So he's a spirit, so he's going to have to reveal himself from that point of view. The second one is that he's what we call transcendent. He's way beyond us, okay? Way, way, way beyond us. It would be like an ant trying to understand calculus, okay? Just be really tough for the ant to do that, right? Just way beyond them. The, so what we need is for God to reveal himself to us because God is way beyond us. 
And so God does this through creation. We look at creation, we can learn some things about God. We can learn that he's powerful and he's majestic. He's into the details of life. We can learn those kinds of things. We can learn it because God reveals himself sometimes by talking to people. He whispers uh, to people. And, but the ultimate revelation of God is Jesus. Jesus is it. Jesus is God in the flesh. The, the, the book of Colossians in the Bible says it's the invisible God being made visible. It says a little later that the fullness of God, everything about God is in Jesus. He is God in the flesh. He is the perfect revelation of God. I don't believe we're ever going to see God the Father because he's a spirit being, but I believe we see Jesus, we've seen God. In fact, Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've really seen the Father. This is who he is. But in addition to that ultimate revelation of Jesus himself, God gave us the Bible. He chose to reveal himself through a book. And the act of doing that comes with this second word, and it's the word inspiration. And again, I'm going to ask you to help me with that. Can you say that word with me, please? Inspiration. Inspiration. Now, now, sometimes when people think of inspiration, they're thinking about seeing a piece of art and getting inspired by it, or seeing a sunset and feeling really good inside. That's not what we mean. What we mean by inspiration is this. Inspiration is when the Holy Spirit of God, that's a member of the Godhead, moved men. Okay, it was a patriarchal culture. Men were educated. Women were often not educated. Moved men to write God-breathed, and that word is sometimes translated in the Bible, inspired words that were divinely authoritative for faith and life. Here's how the Bible puts it in 2 Tim Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed. And this term is also sometimes translated, in some translations, all scripture is inspired by God. So God comes along and he inspires. What he does is he gets these men to write down on paper, as it were, the very words he wants written down. Sometimes it's dictation, like the Ten Commandments or some prophecies. Most of the time, though, it's coming out of the experiences of the authors. They're writing poems. They're writing history. They're writing biography. They're writing their own experiences. They're writing theology. And God's Holy Spirit moves in them in such a way that what gets written down is what we call inspired. The writings are the breath of God. So these original writings penned by Moses and Paul and Peter and so on, all other people, were what we call inspired. They're God's breath, which means that those original writings are without error. They're completely from God, and we need to hear the voice of God when we hear them, right? We have Revelation, which in this particular case turned into a book of, full of books called the Bible. Another thing that happens all the way along here that I want to introduce, at least at this point, is what we call preservation. And preservation is the act of God whereby he protects scriptures, protects the Bible from both internal corruption and external destruction. Let me talk about external destruction. This book is the most attacked book in history. Governments have banned it. They've burned it. They've done a whole bunch of things to try and destroy this book. That's the external attack upon it. Still happens today. Banned in so many places. There's also internal attacks on the, on the content of the book. So arguments that, ah, oh, miracles don't make any sense. There can't be miracles. Oh, you know what? There's contradictions in here. You know, it's just anti-science or it's, 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 it's against science. And so on and on you hear those kinds of attacks on the book. But I would argue that God is actually preserving it. He preserved it against all kinds of destruction physically, even though it cost the lives of many, many men and women who died so we could have this book. And I would argue that the internal inconsistencies or errors that some would argue against or conflicts around the idea of miracles and so on, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But here's what's really fascinating, and that is that the book is still the number one seller in the world. I mean, it's just amazing how God has preserved it and continues to preserve this book. Revelation, God reveals it in writing, that's called inspiration, and then he takes care of, preserves it. Here's the next one. It's called canonization. This is a monster word that people with really tall foreheads invented. <laughs> canonization. Can you say that word with me, please? You ready? Canonization. Now, I don't think about a metal thing with balls that they shoot from pirate ship to pirate ship when you think of canon. Think of the idea of a rule, or, um, and it's spelt differently, by the way. Think about a rule or a standard 
um, uh, that's been set. And what this word is actually about is the whole idea of, um, well, let me show you what it's about. Here's what it says. Canonization is the process, or process, by which books were recognized and collected to form our 66 book Bible. It's the process by which the books were recognized and then put together in this 66 book Bible. Now we got 66 little books in here, little scrolls in here, manuscripts in here, right? Why 66? Why not 75? Why not 50? Why these 66? Why would we choose these ones? Well, that's what canonization is all about. It's this process to determine which books fit into the Bible. And that's just so important for us to understand. Um, so, so last week, um, I shared with you that it's not like Dan Brown says it happens in the Da Vinci Code or how other people say it happens that they pick the books to go inside. Because remember, Dan Brown sort of illustrates it by saying there's this like, big table and a bunch of people came together with religious people and they sort of decided this book is in, this book is out, this book is in, this book is out. It didn't happen like that at all. And I talked to you last Sunday, you want to go back and watch last Sunday about the gradual collection of the books and how that happened. But then ultimately, particularly with the New Testament books, there were criteria that they were using to, here's the word, recognize, not choose, recognize. Do these books match the criteria of what a book would be like if it was part of the canon? And I listed six criteria. There are more than six. But one of the six that I listed said this. Is it written by a prophet or an apostle or a close associate of a prophet or an apostle? That's one of the criteria that you use. And I went through the New Testament, mentioned every single book, and told you who, in my opinion, is the author. And they always fit this criteria. Okay, this, again, is only one of the criteria. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Some of us are going to go to school, you're going to go to university, you're going to take a class on religion, or you're going to, some of us are going to pick up a book, and it's going to attack the authorship of, let's say, one of the New Testament books, where I say John wrote John, and I'm quite happy to debate people on this, where some people say John wrote John. You may read a book that says, no, John didn't write John. Somebody else wrote John. And the inference may be, especially if you're in a classroom setting, where the inference may be that the professor may say to you, therefore, you can't really trust the Bible because we don't know who wrote this book and therefore it's something that's not trustworthy. And I want to say this to you. First of all, there's way more criteria than just the one. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Secondly, I would debate the person because I do think John wrote John or whatever the books would be. Here's the other thing. Because there's more criteria, you'd, you don't have to get hung up on the one spot. If there's some questions around the authorship, the truth of the matter is there's other criteria that would support his, his, his being in there. And I illustrated it sort of this way. Remember last week, I talked about, imagine you were going to pick up Uncle Bob at the airport, at Toronto Airport, the Pearson Airport, but you'd never met Uncle Bob, you'd never talked to Uncle Bob, you'd never even seen Uncle Bob, but you're given a picture of Uncle Bob, and you're going to go down and stand at the arrivals gate and look at everybody who's coming into the room and say, does this look like Uncle Bob? You've got something at which to recognize Uncle Bob. And so you're going to go and look at the picture and you're going to watch as people come through. When you see somebody who looks like Uncle Bob, you're going to take him. Now, what if Uncle Bob's picture doesn't completely match Uncle Bob? For example, supposing he doesn't have any hair now. This is an old picture. Are you going to say, well, he can't be Uncle Bob? No, you're going to say, well, he's the same eyes, same height, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So a number of years ago, our eldest son went to New Zealand to go to a Bible school there, and he was gone for like a year. And he never, um, we, didn't have, we, we didn't have Skype and we didn't have FaceTime. It's hard to believe there was a time in history. <laughs> didn't have them, but we didn't in those days. Or if we did, it was so primitive that we weren't working it with it anyway. So we didn't see him for like a year. But we went to the airport to pick him up because he landed back home from New Zealand. We've been emailing a little bit with him. And he starts walking out, this, out from the, air, uh, the, the arrival's gate. And he's like, so, you know, we don't need a picture because we know what he looks like. So here's this guy coming, six foot five, thin, brown eyes, but he had dreadlocks, okay? <laughs> and so we thought, well, that's just not our son. He doesn't meet all the criteria. So we left him at the airport. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. The rest of the criteria were met, right? I'm not going to throw the Bible out because somebody is saying, well, this one criteria isn't being met. So canonization is this act whereby 
we recognize the books because they fit criteria that's both logical and, I believe, biblical in so many ways, okay? So canonization is this process whereby we collect and gather these particular books. Are you ready? That's what we did last week. Now this is all new stuff. By the way, if you're a newbie here, you're going to think, whoa, that's like a lot of information on a Sunday morning. We don't normally do this, okay? But every once in a while. So here's the next word. After we've got this collection of books, the next word that we need to be thinking about is replication. Replication is the copying of the inspired writings. Here's the deal. You ready for this? We don't have these anymore. They're gone. Zip, zilch, nada. There's just nowhere to be found. Let's think about this for a minute. Moses wrote his books 35 hundred years ago. Okay, think about that. That's a long time. Way past some of you, way when some of you were born. This book was written, okay, on either leather or papyrus. Papyrus is like a, a paperish substance. And as time goes on, and the New Testament books were written 2,000 years ago, as time goes on, guess what happens? They deteriorate over time and with people handling them. So what needs to happen is replication. There needs to be a lot of copying going on. So here's what happens. So the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church at Philippi, the city at Philippi, and the only person that has it is this really big, tall, tough guy in the church. He's the only one who has it. And so people are going, well, I want to read that. Can I read that? No, it's my copy. Well, can I read it? Well, you can take it for a few weeks and copy it. So they would make a copy of it, and they would get, make a copy, and their friends would make copies, and it started to happen that way. And then they developed these what we call schools of scribes, whose full-time job it was to copy the scriptures, okay? How would you like that for a job? No Xerox machine, okay? You gotta get a pen out and you gotta copy from one text to the other text. So there are copies that were made from copies that were made from copies. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of copies, no inspired writings. Now, here's what's really, really fascinating. The amount of copies that we have about the, of the Bible is way, 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 way beyond the number of copies we have for any other ancient writing. Homer's Iliad, I think there are 634 manuscripts. I'm not sure they're all full manuscripts, just part, perhaps. Tacitus, who was a Roman historian at the time of Jesus, there's only two copies that we can find. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of biblical copies, full books, fragments, copies on pottery, copies in leather, and so on and so forth. When it comes to the Old Testament in particular, first half of the Bible, we didn't have a whole lot of copies until 1947. In 1947, a little kid was out with his sheep, and he started firing rocks into caves in an area called Qumran, right near the Dead Sea. You can see some of the caves up here. One of the rocks he threw into the cave made this weird sound because what it did was it hit a jar like this. The kid went in there, opened up the jar, and when he opened up the jar, what he found were ancient writings. Some of them were from a variety of contexts. There was a group here called the Essenes, a very um, isolated group of religious people, and they were really into writing stuff. They'd written a lot of things, among them thousands of, 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 of Old Testament scriptures. And they would often be in these long scrolls, rolled up sometimes, you know, eight meters long, 10 meters long, of, of these writings that were on these scrolls. And by the way, uh, here's a kid firing rocks, and he makes like what some regard as the greatest archaeological discovery in modern history. Is that crazy? So I don't think there's anything wrong with throwing stones. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Just think what you can discover by that, right? When they dug into these scrolls, um, up until this time, from the Old Testament, they had what's called the Masoretic Text, which is a, uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew, but it was written in the medieval era, so uh, around 450 to 1450, depending on how you label it, somewhere around that, that time frame, 500 to 1,000, somewhere in there. But nothing any older than that. But what they found in these scrolls was the, 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 the whole book of Isaiah written 100 years before Jesus. So now we're talking about something that could be as old as 11, 1,200 years old. This is an older manuscript than the ones they had. Uh, Samuel, written in the, in the fourth century before Jesus, and a whole bunch of other writings. And what they did, what was really fascinating, is they, they, um, 
started comparing the, 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 more, the later copies with this older copy. And you can imagine the older copy, let's say it's Isaiah's scroll, written about um, 100 years before Jesus. There would have been copies after copies after copies after copies after copies before they got these ones that are, you know, at the Masoretic text. And what they discovered is that they were almost absolutely identical. Like, the, 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 the copying was just profound. In fact, here's what one man writes, except for a few instances where spelling and grammar differ between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text from 500, that should say 1,000. The two are amazingly similar, similar, just instances of spelling and grammar. It's crazy. Especially when you understand how ancient Hebrew was written. Because ancient Hebrew was written without vowels. So no A, E, I, O, or U that we would call in English vowels. No separation between words. No punctuation and no separation between sentences. You say, oh, that's how I write. Well, they, you're unique, okay? <laughs> so you can imagine, imagine, I put vowels and punctuation in this sentence. Go ahead. Figure out what it's saying. I mean, you can imagine how hard it would be to copy that? Sitting there by candlelight or whatever, copying this. And what does it say? Have you ever seen abundance on a table? Or does it say, have you ever seen a bun dance on a table? I don't know. <laughs> like, what do you do with that, right? I mean, it's just one of those things. Here, here is what's really fascinating. Sometimes um, some people would copy, some of these schools of scribes would copy with the um, uh, one person sitting at the kind of the front of the classroom, as it were, and reading from the, uh, from the text. In the beginning, God. And they would write down, in the beginning, God. Created the heavens and the earth. They would write that down. And uh, that's how they, that was kind of the way of multitasking, you know, making a lot of copies. Of multi, oh, look at this multi-copier school. Um, and sometimes they would sit down and write it out. Um, and uh, sometimes they would be done personally. One school of scribes. And what they've discovered is that as they've done some research on this, uh, what people call textual critics have done research on this and discovered that some schools were particularly focused on the deep details of copying to the point where one school that we know of, and may have been more than one, would take a dowel like this. They would take the copy that would be like the original, the copy they were copying, and they would wrap it around the dowel, okay? After it, you know, this is the copy that they were copying, they'd wrap it around this particular dowel, and then they would uh, take this, and they would pull it out from all the dowel, and they would um, take a pin, and they would look at the letters on the outside of the scroll, and again, this is like, you know, 10, me 10, 10 you know, 10 meters long, and they would take a, take a pin, they'd shove it through specific letters on the outside of the scroll, okay? They'd open up this copy they copied from and set it aside. Then they would take the one that they did, which may have taken weeks for them to copy, and they would roll it around the same dowel, open it up, push a pin through the same opening letters on the top of the scroll, on one end of the scroll, right? Then open up the scroll, and if the pinholes did not go through every single letter exactly the same on the copy they copied from, they burned their copy, okay? And that guy got fired. Okay, that's what would happen. Not sure about the fired part, but I suspect it would. So, so this is what they were doing to try and make sure that the copies, in fact, were well done. So some schools of scribes do this, and um, the copying was taking place. It was just beautiful and amazing that it was happening in, in this way. So, we've got God deciding he's going to reveal himself through a book. The book's called Inspired. It's the very words that God wants. He preserves it. People have given their lives to preserve it. And then, it, then, then, then the people have decided which of the books and actually are God's books, because there's lots of books that are being written, but these slowly gathered. Again, you can go back last Sunday, look at the talk, teaching around that. And then we have all these copies being made. Now, here's the next question. And I know you would have thought of this on your own, and it's this one, and here's the word, identification identification. How do we know which copies are the right copy? Does that make sense? Because here's what's going to happen, right? You got some guy, you know, daydreaming. He's thinking about the Blue Jays when he's supposed to be writing Hebrew, and he just writes the wrong word down. Or maybe somebody's copying, and their eyes get kind of blurry, and they skip a line, or they miss a word, or they repeat a word, or they get bored and go, I'm going to write something in here. I think it's better. It sounds better. It's clearer. And they write something in. So you're going to have all these errors, or what we call variants in the text, what do you do with that? What do, you, what do you do with it? This is called identification, or at least that's my word for it. It's the act of determining the exact reading of the text of Scripture. It's the act or the art 
of determining what is the exact reading. I've got these manuscripts, let's say, before me of the Gospel of John, and this one has a word in it that this one does not have in. How do I determine which reading to, to go with? Well, there's a whole science behind this. And what they will do is they will look at the age of the manuscripts that they're copying, that they're looking at. They will look at the location. They will look at the, the heredity, or, the, or they will trace back the, the lineage of this particular manuscript, which schools were writing it, and they can be so, it's so interesting that they can do this by looking at the language around it and locations where they found the manuscripts and so on, and, and you know, we're finding more and more manuscripts, we're learning more and more about them, that they can act, be that, that exact, and they can start to weigh the manuscripts in terms of, 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 of which one gets the greater weight and which interpretation would be better than the other one. Um, how close, here's the question, how close to the original writings is the manuscript we have chosen to use as the standard for our translations? That's basically the question that they're asking. How close can we get to this? And here's what conservative scholars will tell us, that the difference between what we've got here and what happened there, they call it these to be, what we've got in our hands right now is veritably inspired. That if you look at the Hebrew we've got now for the Old Testament and the Greek we've got for the New Testament, they call it veritably inspired. One man put it this way, the New Testament can be regarded as 99.5% pure, and the correct readings for the remaining 0.5% can often be ascertained with a fair degree of probability by the practice of textual criticism. That's the science of identification. So here, here's the deal, 0.5%, and yet we're probably, we have a good probability about what we're choosing for that 0.5%. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Let me kind of illustrate it this way. Um, in English, the word you, Y-O-U, you know that word? <laughs> can be either singular or plural, right? So I can say I'm talking to you, and I may be talking to one person, or I can say I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to everybody in the room. That's not the case with Greek. The word you for a single person is spelt differently than the word you for a group of people, okay? One of the problems then with translating is that we stick the English word you in when it actually we know it's either singular or plural by the by virtue of the Greek, but we can't do that in English because we don't have a, you know, unless you do y'all or whatever like that, right? So <laughs> we tend not to do that. So, um, I've had the privilege of studying Hebrew and Greek, not particularly good in either one of them, but in the process of learning them, I had to translate. So I translated books out of the Old Testament, translated books out of the New Testament. Let me play with you, around with you with the New Testament. So I have in my office, I have both Old Testament in Hebrew and, and New Testament in Greek, and I have a Greek, a Greek manuscript of the New Testament. And um, so it's really fascinating. So let's say, and I did this, let's say I'm translating the book of Colossians, which I've done. One of the things that, that I find is as I'm reading through the Greek New Testament, it actually indicates when there's a, a, a little difference of opinion or a little, little, little curiousness about the, what, what the reading should be, it indicates on the bottom in the footnotes the manuscripts that hold the word you plural and the manuscripts that hold the word you singular, okay? And they will tell you the reason why they chose singular. And it all has to do with what I mentioned earlier. You know, the, 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 the age of the manuscript, the school of scribes that copied the manuscript, the different geographical locations for the manuscript, there's a whole science around it. But it's so cool that here, here's the other thing that's so amazing, and that is this. Even though we've got this 0.5% differences, and, and, and most of the time it's spelling, it's word order, there is a section at the end of Mark it's a little bit longer, but none of it has anything to do with core belief. None of it has anything to do with how you need to live your life. It's quite different from that, just these simple kinds of copy variants. I was saying to Carol this morning, uh, yesterday morning, we were just kind of laying there and, 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 uh, in bed, just about to get up, and I, I said to her, I got a good question for you this morning. This is how my brain works. Why do you think we've lost the original writings? Why do you think we've lost the inspired text? Which, of course, is exactly what she wants me to ask her on Saturday morning, right? Why do you think we've lost that? And, of course, she's going, I don't know, Ken, why we lost it. You're going to tell me anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> so 
I said to her, and this is just pure theory, I mean, I have no justification for this, I could be totally wrong, and you're welcome to tell me I'm wrong. But I said to her, I wonder if it may be that the reason we don't have those anymore is because we'd worship this book. Because the scrolls were initially put right beside the Ark of the Covenant. Moses put them there, Joshua put them there, and so on. I talked about that last week. And the children of Israel worshipped the ark. I mean, they, they, they took that box out into the battlefield. They led it first to, to, to sort of be like a good luck charm that would help them to win the wars. And what if we did that? What if we turned around and then we began to worship this book? Because we're prone to do that kind of thing. Or maybe another reason might be that God wants us to exercise some faith. He wants us to trust him. Isn't that true of relationships? That you want trust there? And so God is saying, trust me, trust me, trust me. I've given you more than enough to trust me. Just trust me for the 0.5%. Will you do that? And just put your faith and trust and hope in this book. So we've got God's revelation gets put in writing. It's called the Bible. It's inspired. And then he protects this. People protect it. They, they, the canonization is the collection or the recognition of the ones who belong. It's very obvious, very clear. There is this um, replication. The copies are happening. And then we need to identify the exact reading at the text. The next thing that has to happen along here for us to embrace this book is translation, right? And so translation is the act of rendering the Hebrew, the Old Testament Hebrew and Greek, into the receptor language. Do you know that the Bible has been translated into over 2,000 languages? Think about that. 2,000 languages. In many cases, or not many cases, in a lot of cases, Missionaries would go into tribes who didn't even have a written language yet. They had no written language. They simply oral. And they would teach them how to write things down. They would teach them how their language could be formed in symbols and phonetics and so on. In fact, one of the guys on the band this morning, he teaches missionaries to go into places where they don't have a language and learn how to write the language. It's kind of cool. They would go in there and do this and, 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 and often produce, after teaching them how to read, a Bible for them to read. It was really cool. In the English language alone, get this now, there has been, over history, a hundred different translations of the Bible into English. And sometimes if you're, if you're somebody who has the U-version Bible on your, on your phone or in your computer, it's absolutely free, I want to pump it again, it's free, please know it's free, and you can get this thing, and you can see all the English language, or many, many English language uh, translations that are there. It's so beautiful to know that we can pick up this book, because we don't know Hebrew and Greek all that well, most of us. And we can read it in our own language, and it's just awesome what has happened with that. Now, when I think about the Bible in our English language, we can think about two key words. One is the word translation. This is taking, rendering the Hebrew and Greek into the receptor language. Another thing that you can do with Bibles is what's called paraphrasing. A paraphrase is using your own words to express someone else's message or ideas. In the case of a Bible, it's somebody taking the, the message of the Bible and putting it into their own words. It's a big step away from a translation, but it can be beautiful. And when you look at translations, you're going to run into all kinds of them. And you may be saying to me, Ken, which one do I get? I get that question often. I would say, well, I always say to people, it depends what you want to do with it. Okay? So if you want to really study the Bible, if you want to really get into the nitty-gritty of the Bible then a translation I would go with is what's called the New American Standard Version. The New American Standard Version, it's been out for a while, is what we call a wooden translation. They try to make it so close to the Greek that the English actually gets awkward, okay? It's a little awkward, it's more difficult to read, but it is so good to dig into. It is so good to, to really uh, dig right into it. Without knowing Hebrew and Greek, you can dig right into it and learn a lot of the nuances around what's being said, okay? On the other hand, if you're wanting a book to just get up in the morning and read a translation, I would recommend the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation, very recent, it just flows beautifully, and um, you'll find it's a great book, Bible to read. It's not so much a great Bible to study from. You can study from it, no problem, but it won't give you the same kind of insight that New American Standard will. If you want to get something somewhere in the middle, then you can use the New International Version, which is what I tend to use on Sunday mornings, okay? But again, there's lots of choices that are out there. As far as a paraphrase is concerned, Eugene Peterson has wrote one called The Message, and The Message is beautiful. He is an, a poet himself, a um, master of language, and he's taken the text and he's put it into his own words. Again, it's a step away from translating. It's not a book you would study, but it can provide great insights. It's a little bit like a commentary, a running commentary of the Bible. 
So we got revelation into writing, it's preserved, and then it's collected and recognized, it's reproduced, we, pre we identify from the copies which is the best manuscript, then we write these translations. So the next step has to be what? Well, the next step has to be interpretation, right? We want to come along and interpret the text. What does it mean, right? Let me just say this to you. The vast majority of interpretation will happen just from reading. The vast majority of what you'll get from reading the Bible, you'll understand. You will. Especially if you get it in a, in a, in a translation that you can really understand. Well, it, you'll be going, oh, I get that, oh, I get that, oh, I get that, oh, I get that. In fact, the number of places where it becomes more challenging and more difficult are very small and very few. They're there. I love it how Peter writes in the New Testament about Paul's writings. So the Apostle Peter writes about the Apostle Paul and says, man, he writes stuff that's really hard to understand, you know? And if Peter says that about Paul, I can say it about both Peter and Paul, that they both write stuff that's hard to understand, and they do. But what's beautiful about interpretation is this science of interpretation, which means I'm going to look, remember that we've got books that are written to a particular people group a long time ago in a particular context, in a particular language. And we're going to try and interpret that. We have to step into that scene to understand particularly the more difficult challenges or passages that are there. But we can do it. And the cool thing is that there's lots of help this way. There has never been a generation alive like we are today who could understand the Bible like we can understand it. We have all these translations. We've got commentaries, which are books that are designed to help you interpret the scripture. You can go online and get it for free if you go to the right sites and you'll learn some stuff about the Bible there. It's just absolutely incredible. So here's what's happening. Revelation to these writings we call inspired writings. There's preservation and canonization. There's this replication that happens, multiple copies. We try to identify what the right reading should be because we've got all these copies with the inherent variants. Then we have a translation into our language and then we learn to interpret it. Here's the last of the nine. And it goes like this. It's called, I didn't put, it's called application. And application Is, is applying the meaning of the text to life. And, and let me just say this. If you don't do this, all of this is useless. If you don't do this, there's no point to all that. If you don't do this, then all the people who have given their lives and all the people who have studied and all the people who have put this together so we could have this book, they shouldn't have bothered doing it at all. A lot of people end here. You got to end here, Okay. In fact, listen to what the Bible says. Go back to that verse we looked at. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good, what? Work. It's how what I do. It's how I live my life. Let's have some fun. This is the NIV. Let's go to the NLT, the New Living Translation I talked about earlier. It goes like this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. What's the point of the Bible? It's to do, it's to be, it's to live. Let's go one further. I'm going to go to Eugene Peterson's The Message. This is a paraphrase. Watch what he writes. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to what? Live God's way. Through the word we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. Look at this. Training us to live God's way, shaping us up for the tasks God has for us. What's the point of the Bible? It's this. Now listen, please listen and, you know, I love this. I've spent thousands of dollars going to school. Believe me, I believe in this. I buy books on your money. I do it, okay? <laughs> I love interpreting. I love Bible studies. I love studying scripture and teaching it. But if I stop there, I'm in trouble. You got that? Can I rant? Yep. I don't rant very often. This, I'm just going to rant for a minute, okay? And I'll get it out of my system and I'm going to be good for the week. Every once in a while, I get an email from someone who will say to me, Ken, leaving Creekside, not being fed, you don't go deep. And off they go. Happens all the time. 
By the way, it happens to every single pastor I know. In fact, they go from one church to the other and we talk about it, but that's another conversation. (laughs) here's, Here's what's interesting. And cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Okay, you get where I'm going here? The same week, I will get an email from somebody who will say to me, Ken, been at Creekside for a little while. I got to tell you, I've grown so deeply. I'm feeling fed and on and I don't know. What do I do with this, okay? Now, my rant is not about the quality of teaching that's here, okay? I know that people are drawn to different speakers by the virtue of who they are and what they teach and how they teach and so on. I get that. It's okay. I'm fine with that. I love it. Lots and lots and lots of great churches in town. I believe that with all my heart. My point is the definition of deep and the definition of being fed, okay? And I want to tell you, who do you think is the deepest preacher that's ever existed? Anybody for Jesus? Would you go in that direction? Okay, I'm voting for him anyways. If you look at Jesus' teaching, what does he teach? Turn the other cheek, which I had a tough time doing one time this week. I didn't want to. I did. Turn the other cheek, love your enemy, forgive people. Don't worry, watch out for temptation. If your heart's like this, it's like you're guilty of the... You remember what Jesus is talking about in those places? I'm calling that deep. Now, you may be really meaning to me, you're not intellectually stimulating me. I'm okay with that. But don't tell me deep. And don't tell me not getting fed. Because being deep and being fed is all about application. It's about this. It's about couples loving each other like they should. And fathers and mothers valuing their children and pouring themselves into their children. It's about dealing with the junk in our lives and living in a way that honors God. It's about doing this, training us, that's what the Bible's for, to live God's way, not cram our heads full of knowledge. It's how do I live? That's why the Bible is here. That's why it's so beautiful and so practical and so powerful. And that's why it's so hard. Because it isn't a head thing, it's a heart thing, it's a life thing. Can I live this out? God says, I want to help you. I'm going to tell you what the best way to live is, and I'm going to help you get there. So how are you doing with the Bible? Oh, thank you. Six hundred years before Jesus was born, there was a little kid who came to the throne in Jerusalem. His name was Josiah. His father, Ammon, had been assassinated, so he, all of a sudden, gets to be king. I can't imagine, I can't in my wildest dreams imagine, you're king, man, the throne, that's, you know, the crown doesn't fit, but it'll get there, okay, here you go. His grandfather, Manasseh, and his father, Ammon, were among the most wicked kings that had ever ruled in Jerusalem. What they did was absolutely vile. They brought in witchcraft. Manasseh offered his own sons as sacrifices on fire. They made idols out of genitalia. They moved idols into the temple. They they did everything they could to violate everything there was to know about God. And the nation suffered dramatically because of it. And all of a sudden, you have on the throne this eight-year-old kid whose ancestors are terrible, terrible, terrible ungodly men. At 16 years of age, according to 2 Chronicles 34, 2 Kings chapter 22, Josiah has an encounter with God that absolutely revolutionizes his life. And at 16 years of age, he issues an edict to cleanse the land of everything his grandfather and his father had set up. All the idols are to be torn down. The witchcraft is to be removed from the place. We are going to get back to worshiping God. And he turns the nation around. When he's 26 years of age, 2 Chronicles 34 tells us that he decides it's time to rebuild Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple has collapsed It's broken down. You know, it's built 400 years before this, and Manasseh and Amnon, his his ancestors, have not taken care of it. They've abused it. As I mentioned, they put an idol inside the temple. It was awful what they did. He says, we are going to renovate God's temple. And I just can't imagine Solomon's temple getting that way because it was absolutely stunning from an architectural point of view. But he says, I'm not going to raise your taxes. I'm going to offer you the opportunity of taking up an offering, of bringing money for us to do this. And the people brought the money to such a degree that Josiah was able to say, let's make it happen. Well, while they're cleaning out the junk in the temple, Hilkiah the priest finds a scroll, but not just any scroll. He brings it to the the palace and says, this 
is the book of the law. Now, if you've been tracking with me in this series, you know that the book of the law is the title for the Bible before we decided to call it the Bible, okay? So it's the writings of Moses and Joshua and the kings and so on. He finds it in the temple. Some scholars believe this is the only copy of the Bible which talks about this word right here, right? Preservation. And when Josiah sees what he has in his hands, this godly king literally tears his clothing, puts ashes on his head, gets on his knees and says, oh God, what have we done to you? He's so brokenhearted by this. He says to them, read it to me. They begin to read this book to him and he launches a revival in the nation to turn God's people back to him because of this book. Now, as I thought about that story, I thought about us. And I wonder how many of us have a Bible that's lost, like though the book of the law was right inside the temple. Maybe you got it home. Maybe you got a Bible that isn't lost, but it's never opened. And you don't read it. And as I said to you earlier, we have so many incredible we are in such an incredible time in our lives with such amazing translations and so on. And I would, I would argue that for you and I, our responsibility is even greater to read this book. They didn't even have copies like we do. And I would just urge you and I not to do what happened in Israel, in our homes, in our own personal lives. It's not about, I mean, it's all about this, but it's more importantly about that, taking it and applying it to our hearts. And God wants to speak to you through this book, and maybe for some of us, we need to start again. And to find a translation we can read, we need to just make, take the, the, the time and the discipline to, to, to just get into it and to understand it. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for each person in the room today. Thank you for this teaching that we have about the Bible. I pray that you would take its truths and, and just bring them into our hearts. Some of us might have these little slivers of doubt about the Bible, and I slivers of doubt that kind of keep us distant from it, slivers of doubt that weaken our faith, I pray that you would help us to remove some of them and re-fall in love with, again, maybe for the first time, this book, and love it, and read it, listen to it, and hear your voice so that we can live lives that reflect Jesus. I pray it in his name. Amen.